Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 39. Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 39. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, ever since sin entered the world, two realities have been clearly seen. Satan has been at work to destroy, but God has been at work to save. Satan acts to steal, kill, and destroy. God acts to give, resurrect, and restore. Satan is cruelly blinding mankind's eyes to the wonder of God and their dire need of him. God is mercifully opening those blind eyes to the brilliance of his glory in the face of Jesus. These realities can be seen throughout the pages of God's story recorded for us in the Bible, but nowhere can we see them so clearly than at the crucifixion of Jesus. The events that took place that Friday stand at the pinnacle of human history as God's plan of salvation came to pass exactly as he ordained it. But because God's word is active and living, piercing through to our hearts and calling for a response, what Mark recorded for us here in tonight's passage isn't here to simply provide us with facts that support the historical reliability of the crucifixion of Jesus, although it does do that. But what we have in front of us tonight here in Mark 15 is more than just mere words. They're God's words. He's saying something to us. And he wants us to respond. And so on this Good Friday, I'd like us to listen with fresh ears to what God is saying and how he wants us to respond. I've titled tonight's sermon, The Way to God. And I'd like to start by reminding us why we need a way to God in the first place. And while Mark doesn't explicitly talk about why we need a way to God in chapter 15, it was the very first thing he mentioned when he began his gospel account back in chapter 1. Mark begins his gospel account there in chapter 1 this way, quote, 
the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And as you know from this account, after John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord, Mark then tells us that Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In other words, because of the entrance of sin into the world, the world was in need of a gospel, some good news. And Mark writes to tell us that Jesus was the one who came to bring it. But if you don't know much about sin, then when you hear talk about its entrance into the world, while you still probably agree that it's not great, you may not fully understand why sin is such a problem. So I want us to go back to that Old Testament person, Isaiah, who Mark quoted from, because Isaiah has more to say about this way to God and why we need one. First, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, he says, quote, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. God says that sin is not just common to to some, but that we are all sinners. Isaiah then proceeds to tell us in chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, that, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Do you get what Isaiah is saying there? He's saying that mankind needs a way to God because we're sinners, and our sins have separated us from God and hidden his face from us so that he doesn't hear us. And to be separated from God is to be separated from the one who is the sustainer of life, the very definition of love, the source of true joy, the only one who is not only willing but also able to help us. And if our sins separate us from God and hide his face from us so that he doesn't hear us, then friends, we're in serious trouble. We need a way to God. And Mark wrote to say there's good news, and it's come to us in the person of Jesus, whom God has sent to make a way for us back to him through the forgiveness of sins. We need a way to God because our sins have separated us from him. But that's not the only reason. God's word goes on to tell us that there's more bad news that we have to face. And that bad news is that Satan is actively opposing God's way of salvation. And Mark weaves this thread of reality all throughout his gospel account. He does so in chapter 1 by telling us that Satan sought to turn Jesus away from carrying out God's plan of salvation by tempting him with another way there in the wilderness for those 40 days. Mark adds to that by telling us in chapter 4 that when People hear the message of the gospel that Satan immediately comes and takes away the word. Mark continues by telling us that Satan employs his tactics of temptation in the lives of people by exploiting their sinful bent towards things like earthly power, riches, and ease. And that tactic of the evil one led to the act of betrayal of Jesus by Judas and the acts of physical and psychological suffering that Jesus endured at the hands of those we read about in tonight's passage. So why do we need a way to God in the first place? We need a way to God because our sins have separated us from him and because the evil one is actively opposing God's plans to save us. And while those two reasons may serve to answer the question as to why we need a way to God, some may wonder, can we trust the way that God has provided? Can we trust the way that God has provided? 
Well, our passage tonight holds two reasons out for us as to why we can trust the way to God that he has provided for us. And the first reason that God wants us to see is because he always keeps his word. God always keeps his word, and sometimes he does so by actually using the evil actions of his enemies. God always keeps his word, and sometimes he does so by actually using the evil actions of his enemy. And Mark lays this first point on thick by pointing out multiple Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by the evil action of Jesus' enemies. Let me give you just a few of them so you can see what I mean. Centuries earlier, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, telling of his anointed one who would one day come and, quote, offer his back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I hid not my face from mocking and spitting. Isaiah 50, verse 6. God spoke through the psalmist, telling of his anointed one who would one day be served, quote, food with gall and vinegar for drink. Psalm chapter 69, verse 21. Psalm chapter 22, verse 18, tells us that his enemies would, quote, divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Psalm chapter 22, verse 7, tells us that the day would come when, quote, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults shaking their heads, saying, He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Do any of those things remind you of what we read of from tonight's passage here in Mark chapter 15? All these prophecies came to pass as Jesus' enemies gathered against him, and while they meant it for evil, God was sovereignly at work using their evil to bring his good word and purposes to pass right down to the letter. Jesus knew this about his father, and that's why he entrusted himself to him, even unto death, and it's a reason, friends, that we can too. God always keeps his word. But God also wants us to know that his way can be trusted because his love goes farther than we can imagine. The way that God has provided for us can be trusted because God's love goes farther than we can imagine. And how far does it go? How far would God go to demonstrate his love for us? Well, the answer is found in the fact that God gave up his own son for us. And he did so by lifting him up so that all could see. Please don't miss this merciful act from the Lord. As he lifted his son between heaven and earth, not only fulfilling the way in which Jesus would die, but also showing the world that the way for sinful mankind to be made right with God is only through Jesus. God in his love lifted his beloved son up on that cross against the backdrop of a supernatural darkness so that we wouldn't miss the light of our salvation. But the love of God for us is also seen in the fact that God sent Jesus to bear our sin and shame upon himself. God sent Jesus to bear our sin and shame upon himself. And the weight of that was surely felt by Jesus as they crucified him. But I think God wants us to know through the pen of Mark that while the physical pain was immense, the psychological pain matched it, if not exceeded it. And I say that because even though the act of crucifixion itself was the ultimate form of physical suffering, Mark doesn't spend hardly any ink on those gory details. It's almost as if something else stuck out to him. Have you ever been mocked? 
And I don't mean as a group, but I mean singled out by a group and mocked. If you have, then you know that the worst of those times is when there's nothing you can do but stand there and take it. Even if you know full well there's nothing that you've done to deserve it. Don't you wish in those moments that you could just disappear? I think our own experience of being mocked says something about the suffering that Jesus endured for us. That instead of just dying and getting it over with, Jesus endured the mocking of the soldiers, the mocking of the bystanders, the mocking of the chief priests and scribes, the mocking of the criminals who were at his left and his right side. And when the one whom Jesus entrusted himself to was silent instead of rescuing him, Mark tells us that Jesus cried out from the psychological pain of being forsaken by his father. God's word tells us that Jesus was God's beloved son who came to bring salvation by bearing our sin and shame. And it was a load that crushed him physically and psychologically. Friends, Jesus endured the full weight of our sin. The sin that affects us and others physically, but also the sin that affects us and others psychologically. Sins that we have committed and the sins that others have committed against us. All of it was carried by Jesus, and he paid the penalty of it in full on the cross. And he did so for all who trust in him. Listen to how Isaiah 53 so beautifully puts it. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. I believe God wants to remind us again tonight that as we reflect on the events of that first Good Friday, that there is an overarching narrative to human history. And that narrative is this, that ever since sin entered into human history, two realities have been clearly seen. Satan has been at work to destroy, but God has been at work to save. And at the pinnacle of this ultimate of battles stands the cross of Jesus Christ. And in two short days, we'll celebrate together the victory of victories as we know that Christ was risen from the dead. But as we go home tonight, let's take with us the hope we have in God that his plan of salvation was not then, nor can it ever be, thwarted. Let's take with us the confidence found in the confession of the centurion that surely this man, Jesus, the one who we follow, surely he is the Son of God. And let's respond to this hope and confidence by continuing to trust in God's ways of salvation through Jesus, whose death stands to remind us that God's word always comes to pass and that his love goes farther than we can imagine. And let's take heart in the fact that neither our sin nor our shame nor the plans of the evil one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. So Lord, thank you over and over again for making a way for sinful man. A way that overcomes the separation between us that our sins brought about. A way that opens your ears to our cries that our sins had once stopped up. Thank you for appointing this way of salvation through your Son. 
Thank you for accomplishing this work through the cross. And thank you for applying it to us by grace alone through the work of your spirit. It's with very humbled and eternally grateful hearts that we remember tonight the events of Good Friday. And it's in Jesus' name, our Savior's name, that we pray. Amen.